<laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, do, were there any talks about um, you know the batch HPS also in the um, in the normal like in the rest of the days, or was it only in the colloquial? Because we might have uh, yeah, we might have went to those. Um, there was quite a few that we had we attended, uh, given yeah, yeah, uh, our interest. But um, wasn't sure if you listed those because I I kind of was trying to look into my schedule and see what was. Yep. What did that I pinned exactly? But I can't find my schedule. Okay. I think I right. Do. So, yeah. Yeah, I know that during the event, there was quite few, like few related to GPU. Like uh, the guy from Google was saying uh, oh, wow. some stuff to op optimize Google. I think there was another for from Vulkan or above Vulkan, done by, uh, can't remember the vendor now. Uh, All right. And there was a few others, but like me for example i focus more on kubernetes itself not necessarily only on the batch so one of the my observation and main team in um, kubecon for the remaining days was ebpf so as a way of improving one performance getting more observability and uh, more control on your uh, network layer in <laughs> kubernetes so there was a we, we spoke to like few vendors on the booth like uh, Calico and Cilium, both very interesting. That's something we're gonna probably try soon or soonish in, in GR as well to pl play a bit more with eBPF. Uh, other interesting are, are, are quite a bit around automation and practices like people, you can see clearly that like Argo CD is getting more mature. So I went to a talk where the how it's called, the, let's say vendors, but the, the, the team responsible for for owning Argo CD or talking how to extend it, what, what they plan, the roadmap and stuff like that. That was quite cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I actually mentioned the batch in HPC day, but there was also GitOpsCon as a co-located before the conference and then mm -hmm. a ton of con uh, talks about GitOps as well during the conference, both for Argo and Flux, yeah. But maybe maybe we can like if you find the the links in the sketch, maybe drop them in the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I, them. yeah. I just hit recording, so we should be able to then find the chat and and collect them again. Again, it was as well like it was my first KubeCon, and I was surprised by the number of people attending. There was like seven thousand or so people on, on the site. Yeah. And sometimes it was quite challenging to get into the room if you're not early enough into the room, especially if the particular talk was like super interesting and getting a lot of traction. So it was yeah. like if you are not 15 minutes earlier in the room, uh, you're not getting in. Luckily, there was a way of watching them virtually. So that was yeah. as well quite cool. But there is one talk I haven't watched even yet where I think it was Mercedes. Benz explaining how they migrate 700 or 7,000 cluster from uh, Terraform and other infrastructure to using cluster API. So that, that's, yeah, quite a few lessons there. And I think that was another ob observation, like Kubernetes become more and more a framework to doing stuff like that. There is quite a few talks around uh, cross-plane. So cross-plane as a way of managing infrastructure other than just pure Kubernetes stuff using Kubernetes and yep. uh, Kubernetes uh, reconciliation loop to enforce the state and stuff like that. So that was quite cool as well. Yeah. Nice. A few post-mortems as well. So a few talks about post-mortems. So if you're running uh, Kubernetes for a scale for people, so that was as well quite interesting seeing how, I think it was Datadog, so Datadog, uh, running into the issue and uh, spending like few months investigating stuff uh, on their Amazon infrastructure. Yeah, is that the DNS one? Yes, yes, yeah, that was a good good talk. And I'm pasting the links here in the chat as you, as you speak. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we have some join us. A small screen, so yeah. I don't know, it can be three of us in the same time, <laughs> yeah. Cool, yeah. So, there was as well quite a lot of talks like casual talks happening during the lunch uh, to, to various people, 
and, and again to vendors. So one of the vendors we're kind of using is uh, the one behind OPA. I don't know whether any of you is using OPA. OPA is a, a way of defining a policy. So before going to KubeCon, we face a few issues where we try to restrict some stuff. So we start discussion with them and, and so on. So that was, again, quite a nice thing, side, side thing in, in KubeCon. Nice. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, so I, I tried to collect a few talks and put it in the chat, but feel free to add uh, if I miss some. Uh, yeah, I think I actually been to the one uh, improving GPU utilizations. Yes, I was there. I think was it from Google? Yes, that was quite interesting. Although it can it kind of was a letdown that they didn't actually talk about the implementation details, but it was quite interesting about how you know the theoretical side of things. Um, okay. Let me also try and grab something else out um, because I need to find my scat from here. It was one, a few one that I attended was, the one that I attended that was quite interesting was uh, network hour scheduling, although it did look like something that will require quite a lot of time before it can be implemented on production cluster. Uh, let me see if I can find it. The scheduling. Did it start already? Oh yeah, yeah we just, uh, I think it's it's yeah. online. So this one was quite interesting. But you're just not listening to them, I guess. Yeah, we're yeah. talking to them oh, okay. right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, another interesting one uh, was uh, ephemeral containers. So I'm not sure whether you're aware about ephemeral containers. That's a new thing in Kubernetes 1.23, uh, and I think it's going to be even more mature in future. They, the idea is when you need to troubleshoot a problem with your pod or with your application inside the container, rather than using kubectl exec, which many people do, you'd run the command kubectl debug. The difference is exec move you kind of like almost as a sage into the, the, the container you're troubleshooting, but with debug, it spin additional site container. So you can define that you have completely different set of tools in that site containers. And by being a site container, they share the same uh, namespace Linux namespaces, not uh, Kubernetes namespaces. So by doing that, you have the access to the same network namespace and so on. And you can use NS enter, so namespace enter, to even get access to bit namespace uh, and a few other name Linux namespaces. And that, that was quite cool because it allows you to have very minimalistic image. You can use probably distro less and start building building more tools and, yeah. and stuff like that in, in the, into site containers. And the site container, once you finish executing you, you, your kubectl debug command, it is gone. So you don't need to worry about having the sidecar constantly running. So we, we actually do use that at CERN. Like it, it became better in 1.23, but it was alpha before, so you could enable it in the clusters. And we were enabling it. And what we do is we keep one image that has all the debugging tools we need for networking, uh, uh, everything, file systems, whatever. And we use that image uh, to debug and attach uh, using an ephemeral containers when we debug stuff. I put the links there as well. So it was okay, okay. through my sketch. Oh, another one interesting, kind of interesting, depending on what you do, is uh, about Qvirt. So Kubevirt, uh, again, you use Kubernetes to manage your VMs simply. But they added quite a few additional features like live migration and so on. So that's another product which is becoming more and more mature. And in the future, probably it could be a way to like, rather than directly using, I don't know, OpenStack to spin your VM, you can use Kubevirt to control and do VM migration and other stuff. Yeah. So Kubernetes as a framework again. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there was a few talks as well about horizontal port, autoscaler, 
uh, using Keda as well for that. There was, yeah, the talk wasn't bad. I think there was a project called Pixie, or yeah, I think Pixie. Pixie, yeah, to um to capture the the traffic, right? The, yeah. yeah, yeah, to be able to actually produce it. Um, yeah, to test actually an application. Um, yeah, no, yeah, that, that that's a good point. There was an interesting talk about I can't remember the title. I will find about different approach to doing a load test or in general a test because let's say you run a web application on your kubernetes it's a web service so you to deploy a new version of that web service so you can do a few approaches one you have let's say staging cluster or something like that you deploy there and maybe test somehow like write some integration tests another one is uh, having like canary approach, so like blue green, where you redirect a bit of traffic to your new version. That's what people quite often do with services much like Linkerd and stuff like that. But the talk was that the problem with that approach is you not necessarily has consistent uh, inputs going to that uh, web service. Let's say if you're doing the change in the middle of night, you don't have the same traffic or the same number of users, so you don't really know that whether the the way you're promoting your new, start, new application is working at all or not. So the idea is, I think it's still using eBPF as well to capture the traffic. So in other eBPF related uh, is to kind of tap, like like, like start tapping the, the traffic and record that traffic. Once you have the traffic kind of recorded, you can reapply that later on anytime and it's gonna have the same volume and so on. So you can deploy your web service in, in, without impacting a user. You run recorded uh, traffic, and if the behavior is not different than before your change, then probably you are good, and you can uh, try AB release at that point or Canary release. It was quite a good talk. I will try to find out the, the name of the talk. I, I just pasted it there. Uh, that's, it should be the last link in the chat. Oh, yeah, the one. The reproducing issue in your CI pipeline. That, 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 that's the one. Yeah. yeah. I still have the schedule in my head somehow. So <laughs> <I've seen laughs> I didn't watch them, but I, I remember the title. Yeah, it, it was very good, to be honest. Yeah, yeah there was a there was a uh, recording team of EPPF this year. Um, it's quite interesting. I, I, I remember hearing about EPF, EPPF quite a few times in the past. But this one really was, uh, yeah. You can see already that the tooling is is getting more mature, or at least more more known around the community. Uh, so, in fact, there was another talk. I think this is also quite relevant to the scheduling part, um, which is about bandwidth management using um, eBPF again. Uh, let me just paste the link here. Uh, yeah, first. it was definitely the 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 conference of the eBPF. Yeah, it was. It was everyone's yeah. back. I agree. It, 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 I think it was something that we could see coming already for a while now. Um, but yeah, this one was definitely the confirmation that it's going to get bigger uh, from now on. Uh, in fact, the one from Badwin Management was quite interesting because it was uh, starting to, yeah, they were um, adding this basic possibility of um, adding into the um, into your basically depl deployment. Um, the um, also the resource around how much bandwidth you want to allocate to a specific um well pod um and that's quite that's quite interesting uh as that it's only possible through the the way ebpf works and how you can get those kind of informations out of the kernel um yeah i mean again uh very cool uh yeah. I pasted the link there i don't right now i should have oh yeah there was sorry i was looking at the at the at the information here there was something they were talking about where they were also uh mentioning how with the with this um new approach you could also have higher speed of communications uh let me just look at this the scalability limits of token bucket filter by the bandwidth plugin earliest departure time yeah combined with ebpf um yeah something about being quite yeah cool uh, both in bandwidth management and uh, getting more speed yeah. out of what's available. So one looking at with the PPF is uh, uh, with Cilium to do 
sort of like cluster mesh, so not, not only like a service mesh, but really. I was about to mention <laughs> multiple clusters to to be meshed together at the pod level, even and and you can easily do load balancing across clusters without having to rely on services. Which for the batch use case is actually quite interesting because we don't want to have the like we don't really care about the service abstraction, we just care about the workloads. And uh, that this is something we started prototyping, which is to mesh multiple clusters and be able to schedule across them from a single plane, basically. Well, so so that's interesting because when I, I chatted with them about scheduling across multiple clusters, I thought that th their response was, "Oh no, this is really only meshing the networks together so that pods can speak to other pods in other networks uh, in, in other clusters." But the scheduling of them, you'll still need to do somewhere else. Um, right. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it allows you to, to like, even if you have, uh, if you want to distribute the workloads across clusters, you can rely on having, like, a, some services running uh, internally in one cluster without having to replicate them everywhere, for example. And, and you would just, uh, like you could have these workload clusters that are really disposable while you have the service clusters in the same mesh um, or the, the service, the component clusters in the same mesh. So we've been playing with this also. But, it, but actually, with some tricks, you can, you can actually schedule across uh, clusters as well. This is something we've been playing with, but maybe, maybe for another time. Yeah, I'd love to hear that and also whether you're seeing reasonable performance for, you know, often you want jobs to be co-located so that the network speed is fast enough for them to talk to each other. But yeah, uh, anyway, th those, that would be interesting to talk about maybe next time. The big thing we've seen is the, that you still need like node to node connectivity, like layer three connectivity between all nodes across all clusters, which, uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense, but it's not like a gateway or anything you need like Full full mesh between nodes as well. Mm -hmm. I think something like that was mentioned in the Datadog talk about DNS, where they try that they are using uh, Cilium exactly to do a pod to pod routing yeah. possible across multiple cluster. I'm not sure whether across multiple different cloud providers. Maybe they achieve even that. But but wow. there you need some sort of like VPN connectivity, I guess, because you need to expose all nodes to all nodes. So this is this is our dream, which is to burst uh, using a mesh like this. But it but it's actually trickier than than it could be, I guess. If you if like if you look at uh, other things for service connectivity, they use gateways. Here it's really like a full mesh between all nodes. At least my understanding up to now. But it is promising. It sounds amazing. But it, 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 it's actually something maybe maybe we should bring them to present uh, Cilium and eBPF to the group. That would be cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll, we, we, we are getting Liz to come to CERN uh, in two weeks. So maybe uh, she can also do a talk, the same talk at group. Let's, let's put it for, for the list here. They will definitely bringing a lot of uh, uh, more interested uh, parties into these. Uh, a research group. You mentioned the gateway. I think the another talk was about gateway API. So it is going from beta to GA. It was quite a good talk as well. Yes. I can dig the link out actually because uh, I had it in my schedule, I think. Um, I'll put here for. Uh, I'll put it for the next one. The topic for Cilium and EBPF, but maybe we. You can see. Yeah, I'm just pasting the gateway API link as well. Uh, let's see. Nice. Yeah, the, the other stuff I had here in the summary is just uh, I, I saw that work a lot of references to batch uh, workloads not only in in the talks but also in the keynotes. So in the TOC update, it was mentioned that there was the new group 
uh, formed as part of the tag runtime. Um, and then also in the Kubernetes uh, updates, the batch working group in six scheduling, and then like the keynote also from from CERN, we mentioned the the computing uh, use cases, and you there mean, were you mean, other you mentions. Mean, you mean the one that you gave? Yeah. Yeah. You're so modest. You're like, oh, the one from CERN. I don't. I don't know who those people are. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, but definitely it wasn't a coincidence. Like I, I tried yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. So, and also in the other ones, like this has been appearing a bit everywhere. But I think there was it was clear that from the references constantly in different keynotes, slowly build, building momentum. And when we see the other activities as well, and then um, yeah, so. And then there was one session dedicated to the Kubernetes working group batch. There will also be the video uploaded. So Aldo gave an overview of uh, the work that has been going on already and, uh, and the plans. And uh, there was not a lot of different people speaking, but there were, I, I, I talked to a few and it seemed like there were both developers and uh, also end users interested in using these tools. So that, that was quite nice. And just to re really quickly, so they, they summarized the motivation. I think we all know about it here, but they also mentioned uh, that their goal is to, it's three main tasks. One is to update the job API to allow uh, new types of workloads that are not just the typical batch job as defined by Kubernetes up to now. Then things like queuing, um, and uh, um, advanced scheduling. And then I think that the, the interesting part that uh, there was a nice talk in the co-located event about was the, the optimized uh, scheduling on the node itself to, to make sure that like, the, the nomad apologies are set properly so that you get full performance and you're not losing like 20 or 30% of your uh, capacity because of it. So I think that it was an, a nice, I think Alex, you were there as well, right? Yep, no, I was there, uh, very jet lagged, but yes, I was there. Uh, it was good. I, I, I would just reiterate the, the number, the amount of batch scheduling related talks, they had the batch day and uh, Aldo talk, and then I was on the panel a day later, and then you spoke in the keynote, and it was, um, we weren't quite at EBPF status, but uh, batch was was rising in the ranks of conversation. It was good. Yeah. And I'll pitch one more talk, which was from uh, some other CERN colleagues, and they they gave a talk uh, later. I think Thursday. I don't think the video is uploaded yet, but basically what they've done, like we have this large grid computing environment, and they've been playing with getting Kubernetes being a grid site and it doesn't matter if it's on premise on a public cloud, whatever. Nice presentation where they showed that they could scale a single Kubernetes cluster to 100,000 cores in the Google Cloud in this case, um, quite easily and fast and then even scratch it when they don't need it. Yeah, and they justified that uh, this is like an out of the box solution to integrate new resources into our grid infrastructure and also the ability to to request resources that we don't have is or TPUs. And their dream is to have like a home chart that does help install grid site and and uh, you just add it to the infrastructure. So they gave uh, they gave some some summaries here uh, of their what they've been doing integrating heterogeneous like ARM and GPUs. And then they actually built an analysis facility on top of this. So they have the Kubernetes uh, layer as kind of the base layer to add the resources, but then they add like Jupyter Hub and they add the ability to deploy like uh, task clusters dynamically for different users. Um, so people can do their analysis using Jupyter Hub and then scale out using Dask to, to a very large number of uh, resources. 
so I don't think the video is uploaded yet, but for sure it will be, Nathan. So I, from from the link, in, I, I will find the link in the agenda for you. And then there should be like a link soon with the video. For some reason, my computer is blocking a bit. But... Oh, I'll post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll post the link in a bit. So I think it's, it's an interesting talk because it's... Uh, uh, a real use case and pretty large of doing both batch and and kind of more interactive uh, analysis. Is is Panda batch processing yet another batch scheduler thing that people have written? That... No, Panda is like a it's a specific scheduler for Atlas. So they they have their own uh, workflow manager on top, uh, and that's where all the workloads. So Panda is a, is their thing. Yeah, yeah. I just wondered whether they, uh, is it an open source thing or? It is, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I can't find anything to, on it. I can, I can. Under batch processing does not yield a usable Google address. Say that again? Panda batch processing does not yield a usable Google address so far. No. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one. Uh, where, where, where the actual documentation is. So it is a generic tool, but it's very much, uh, um, it's used by other experiments as well, but it was developed uh, within Atlas. I, I pasted the link there. Cool, thanks. Um, I wanted to find the link to the talk. Let's see, Atlas. So here's the link to, the, to this one. And uh, yeah, the video should appear there. I think they they are done with all the collocated events and they started uploading the main conference videos as well. There's some sort of delay where videos are available. Like if you have the virtual access, you can go to, to the virtual platform and watch the videos right now. Uh, otherwise they, they will get to YouTube at some point as well. And uh, I think that's it. That's all I have, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think that the expectations were met for, for the conference. They were, uh, and they, they mentioned 65% new attendees in a KubeCon before. So that's pretty impressive. That's pretty awesome. I was really disappointed to miss out, actually, but um, definitely going to be there in the. Well, going to try to be there in Detroit. Should yeah. be good. I really felt like um, it was three years worth of budget all spent into one KubeCon because of the pandemic. I mean, uh, quite quite a lot of uh, things going on. Uh, I have to say, yeah. um, really, it was a good one to be to attend to attend to. Yeah, and definitely you can see the difference of having in-person conferences and being able to. Like just bump into people and discuss quickly. It's, it's very different. Yeah, definitely. I remember I attended the virtual one the previous year, uh, but then yeah, you could see, you could definitely feel there was like, um, yeah, it just felt soulless, so to sp so to speak. Um, <laughs> this one, I think I really enjoyed the part. Uh, uh, the the one the, the part that uh, was not in the virtual one uh, last year. Which was the uh, sponsorship booth, basically. You you could just go around and and, and find people and just talk to them, yeah. uh, which was something, of course, it was difficult. You can't do virtually, uh, not in the way you can do it in, in KubeCon, at least um, in person. And it, it was quite massive because there was like two pavilions full of sponsor showcases. It was running in between was uh, was killing me to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Three days after, I was oh, I just couldn't move anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know how he had the strength to also cycle on the weekend, but then, yeah, me, I was just uh, barely hanging. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I think that's that's what I had, actually, I'll stop here. Um, but w one, one thing that I, I wanted to ask as well, because um, uh, th there's not a lot of time between now and October, basically. So if we organize like a new batch and HPC co-located, I think it would be nice because it would help keep the momentum, but we need to be really proactive to reaching out to people to, to do submissions to make sure we have enough content 
Um, there were a couple of talks that were quite good that we didn't select for this one, but maybe we need to make sure we advertise this as much as possible, both in the like new world, but also in like uh, there's some interest. Like uh, Nathan is here, there, there was some interest in like involving more uh, things like uh, um, like more established components like Slurm in the HPC environment and, and try to kind of do the bridge uh, between the two and see uh, what's the way forward. I'm sure Nathan will have a lot of opinions about this, so that would be pretty awesome also to have that discussion. I think his microphone never works, though. I think um, Ricardo A reached out and suggested that we uh, submit something around Armada. We'd be happy to to, to do yeah. something, of course. Um, I, I also wondered, in that batch day, do you know how um, Pretty Base ended up on batch day? I can't. It seemed like it was it was a weird one to include, especially if we had other good. Um, Which one? Sorry, there was a whole talk on Pretty Base. During batch day, which seemed we, I, I like Pretty Base. It was Travis Adair and um, you know the people who did Horovod and Ludwig AI, and it was more ML. Uh, ML. Yeah, so it, I think it was more to get a. a yeah, I, I will have to go back to the notes, but I think it was uh, because they had like a, this idea of a nodeless Kubernetes. Um, that is quite interesting. And also because they had uh, different use case with uh, mm -hmm. That was the reasoning. Yeah. I think be because if you look at the schedule, there's there's quite a lot of components or it's not really vendor, but like component based talks, but not so much end user talks. And I think for the next one, it would be really interesting to have those, but we need to reach out to I see. people. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, if we could get end users of any of the schedules that spoke last time, that might be that might be very interesting. Yeah. And the other question will be, uh, depending on how many submissions there are, if we make it still half day or a full day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to submit something definitely. I know the deadline's approaching, but I've uh, started it at least. Yeah. That would be amazing. Your sandbox, uh, or you submitted to sandbox as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, that as well. Another thing we probably need to do, uh, or we definitely need to do, is work out the next set of um, agendas for this. So I think we've run out now. Uh, it tends to work quite well, I think, setting them up front. Yeah. Yeah, we um, could use like five minutes for that. Yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to do it now, but we could we have a think about yeah. it. But yeah, we've got, as you say, it's only really four months until next QCon anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Not the next round up, but doing, doing them in well, between. The, the CFP is, is this Friday, you know, right? Jamie? I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've started it. <laughs> I'm actually I'm, I'm traveling to some relatives tonight, and I, I plan to just sit up late and just type up my submission. Because the for the batch HPC, if we organize again the colo, it will be later though CFP. But for the main event, it was already this. Right, I'm just gonna get it in. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like if everyone has, we we can probably drop the topic backlog we have there, apart from the gem session, I guess. And yeah. maybe, maybe we, if people can add their, uh, what they would like to hear about. So we just talked about Cilium and EBPF. Uh, uh, we had other, other things mentioned there, right? So we could get, uh, um, um, the Atlas people also to present because it's, uh, it's an, like a use case. Would that yeah. be okay as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
Uh, we mentioned the gateway API. Did we ever get a presentation on that? Probably not, right? Uh, I've missed a couple of sessions, but I don't remember one. Is that is that so uh, germane to this group? I mean, it's it's interesting. It's good. I don't know. Do, do people suffer that in in this world of research? I think I the like mo the main thing would be how to use that for bursting and multi cloud things, if if at all possible. Interesting. Okay, uh, I can see that a little bit. It just seems like it's so much more directly useful for if I have a product and I need yeah. different uh, different HTTP endpoints to go to different places. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but they have this concept because there's the Gateway API and then there's this multi-cluster service API that basically allows you to uh, make a service external and then define on the other cluster that it should consume a remote service and then they kind of link to each other, things like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else did we have here? Cluster API, with the, was that one as well? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're very interested in that, I think. We never had a talk about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cross plane, we did get. Mm -hmm. Stone is done. Uh, something about Numa as well. That would be pretty cool. Maybe. Yeah. Probably not for a whole session, but I noticed um, the other day that proposal finally got merged. The, the one's about six years old around user namespacing. You see that? I did not see that. In Kubernetes? Yeah. yeah. That, and it's coming up in the next uh, Kubernetes release, right? Oh, no. I mean, it hasn't. nothing's been implemented. I think this is just like getting the like, proposal merged. Like a oh, oh, no. I, I thought there was intent to get it in soon oh maybe uh, i i don't know but but yeah that was a at least a big step forward having it looks like an agreement on to, on to do it on doing it yeah no that's a super exciting one um maybe the excitement in my voice is not quite <laughs> uh relaying that excitement but yes super exciting but where, where did you see that actually? Because I'm. Oh, um, um, hold on. I've got it here. Someone sent it to me. Oh, yeah. Alpha, alpha release target 125. Okay, I see it now. I think that's the one. That's it. Yep. Yep. I don't, I don't think there's. Okay, they are targeting 125. That That's pretty good. Also. Okay. But yeah, the, the uh, enhancement got merged basically after about six years, which is good. Uh, I guess there was quite a lot of to figure out on the kernel and friends. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not a small one. Yeah. I just saw that I imagined it would never happen given that it had been there so long, but that's, that's good to see. All oh, right, the, the, that sounds amazing, actually. I think Jonathan just put uh, user nays and rootless stuff. That would be pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think we should get a talk from Nathan with a microphone as well and dedicate a session. <laughs> that would be good. Or just sign language. We can add those. Uh, Nathan, would that be okay to give a, like you, you just mentioned also that uh, uh, you have some reports from sites on what they want and what they report. It would be interesting to to hear about that as well. Would that be fine? Thanks. 
So yes. Doesn't matter. It's a research group. It don't have to be accurate. Right. Yes. And these are natives we also had, right? We, d we did get a talk from about rootless uh, quite a while ago, right? It wasn't specifically about user natives, but... Uh, yeah, I can't remember the guy's name. You'll be on no, it was, uh, it was Akihiro. Oh, yeah. It's always Akihiro on these things. So, yeah, yeah, for sure it was him. But uh, he gave a talk about rootless, but it was more like all the issues of, like, uh, network... Novel AFS and uh, when you do user space stuff. Uh, but maybe like a more focused talk on user natives would be cool as well. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah, so I, I'll just drop the, the link here because. where all this rootless stuff is being tracked by Giuseppe and Aki here as well. That's a good link to have. Nice. Okay. I think we have, maybe, maybe we take these topics, put them in slots and then we, we Hunt for speakers. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds cool. Uh, Nathan, do you have a preference on when to do this? Like before summer, after summer? All right. Okay, so we can schedule the other ones already and then leave a space. Awesome. Okay, there's plenty of talks to go and watch now. Uh, should we put all these links in the agenda? I, I won't be able to do it now, but maybe maybe later. We, and then we, we link it from the Slack channel so that other people can go and, and check them as well. Yeah, we can get, get back and get these, can we? Yeah, yeah, from the recording, the text is also appearing after. Beautiful. I hope. I think we can also export it. Is it? No. No, too much. Right. I think, yeah, in the recording, we can then find it. Awesome. I think that's it. Do we have anything else, Jamie? No, I was just trying to see if I could export the text easily, but yeah, that's fine. We'll we'll grab it later. Uh, no, nothing else for me. I mean, I, can, I haven't got a huge amount to contribute this time, unfortunately, because I wasn't there. But <laughs> um, no, it's good to see uh, people got a lot out of it. Anyway, what well, one thing is that we do. I uh, forgot that because we didn't do this this time. But remember, we have the possibility of doing a talk in the maintainer track. Mm -hmm as well about the group uh, and this last time it actually was quite nice we, we got a few people interested in the group as well so we can we can consider for detroit to also have a slot for, for the group yeah i'm always up for that i think that's good it's just a nice refresher we need to submit it when the maintainer track uh, request will come uh, we need to submit it there yeah just tap me up i'll uh, work on it with you okay cool all right. Good. Awesome. Then I guess that's it. See you in two weeks. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks everyone. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.